The Blessed Eucharist, Our Greatest Treasure by Father Michael Mueller Chapter 3 On the Love of Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament One day two men who were disputing about the possession of a piece of land came to the Emperor Otho that he might decide on the affair in question. Each of them said, The land belongs to me. And what do you think the emperor did when he found himself unable to settle the dispute? He gave to the one out of his own purse as much money as the piece of land was worth, and to the other the land itself, and thus satisfied both. A similar but far more wonderful act of liberality took place at Jerusalem 18 centuries ago. This happened in the following manner. Our Divine Redeemer, having lived on this earth more than 30 years, and the time having come for him to leave it, there arose, as it were, a dispute between heaven and earth. The angels wished to have their Lord and their God with them in heaven again, after he had been for so long a time with men on earth. Men, on the other hand, especially the apostles, desired to detain their divine master, Jesus Christ, with them on earth. They felt very sad when he told them that, he had, that the time had come for him to leave them. Now, how did our sweet Lord act in order to settle this, this dispute? He found out a means to satisfy both men and angels. He satisfied the angels by ascending to heaven. He satisfied men by remaining invisibly with them in the blessed sacrament and by giving power to the apostles and their lawful successors to change bread into his body and wine into his blood. What could have induced our dear Lord Christian soul to stay with us on earth in the blessed sacrament. Was it to gain honor? Alas, our good Lord receives the same treatment in the blessed Eucharist which he received during the 33 years that he lived upon the earth. When upon earth he was made light of, and it was said of him, Is he not the son of a carpenter? Why do you listen to him? said the Pharisees. Do you not see that he is a devil, that he is possessed, that he is a wine drinker and a friend of sinners? They bound him, scourged him, crowned him with thorns, and at last, making him carry his own cross, they crucified him. Such was the honor which Jesus Christ received when living among men. And he has not been treated in this has he not been treated in the same manner in his sacrament from that time to the present day, instead of being honored by all men as he deserves, he is dishonored and insulted. Some do not think of him for weeks together. Others walk carelessly into the church almost like men without faith and make their genuflection before him as if they wished to mock him. Others behave in church as if they were in their own houses. In many churches, there is not even a lamp kept burning. And how often has it happened that the consecrated host have been trodden underfoot or thrown into the fire by heretics, Jews, or, or other bad men? Such has been the treatment he has met with, contempt, mockery, and insult, or coldness and indifference toward his divine majesty. Certainly the expectation of being honored could not have induced him to remain with us. What then induced him to stay with us in the Holy Eucharist? Was it to seek or to increase his own happiness? By no means. His happiness is so great that it cannot be increased. He has risen from the dead. He is glorified. He sits at the right hand of God the Father. 
and has all power in heaven and on earth. The angels serve him. Men are his subjects, whom will he will judge and reward according to their deserts, deserving. The devils tremble at his presence. Every knee must bend before him. Of those that are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, in purgatory, and in hell. What then is wanting to his happiness? Nothing. Since, therefore, our Lord cannot become happier by remaining with us, and since he does not receive due honor among us, what, I ask once more, could have induced him to abide here so long, to remain on earth for 1,800 years, <clears throat> yea, even until the end of the world, to be present in the Blessed Sacrament, in every place, in every parish church in America, Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, in the Isles of the Sea, and even sometimes in the midst of the ocean itself. Ah, Christian soul, there was no other motive than love, the great, the excessive love of Jesus Christ toward men. Yes, it was love, love alone, nothing but love, which induced Jesus, our Redeemer, to remain among us in the Blessed Sacrament. O Jesus, O most sweet Jesus, hidden under the sacramental species, give me now such love and humility that I may be able lovingly to speak of this invention of boundless love that all who hear of it may begin to love thee in reality. O Mary, Mother of Jesus Christ and our dear Mother, O all ye holy angels, who by your adoration in our churches make up, up for the little love which your God and our Savior <coughs> receives from men, obtain for us the grace to comprehend a little the love of Jesus Christ in the Most Holy Sacrament. In order to conceive in some measure the love of Jesus Christ in this wonderful sacrament, let us consider first the time at which he gave himself to us as our food and drink. Jesus might have instituted this sacrament when, in the twelfth year of his age, he traveled to Jerusalem, or at the wedding in Cana, or when he was thirty years old and began to teach publicly, or he might have instituted it after his resurrection. But he chose, for the time of its institution, the last moment of his earthly career. Why did he wait so long? Why did he not institute it sooner or later? Why not after his resurrection? Why just at the moment when he was about to take leave of the apostles and quit the earth? He instituted this sacrament at the last moment of his life in order that men might the better see the excess of his love. Do you ask how this is? To make it clearer, imagine a father who has in store a costly presents of gold and jewels, which he intends to give to his children in order to show them how much he loves them. What time do you think this father will choose for bestowing these gifts as being best calculated to make a deep impression on them? He will wait until he is on his deathbed, and then he will give them that they may be the last memorials of his love. Behold, our divine Savior thought and acted in the very same manner. He thought, I have already given men so many proofs of my love towards them. I have created them. I preserved their lives. I have become man for their sake. I became a child. I have lived among them for more than 30 years. I am yet to suffer and die for them on the cross and to reopen heaven for them. What can I do more for them? Ah, I can make them 
one more present. I will give them a most precious gift. I will give them all that I have so that they may not be able to charge me with having done less for them than I might have done. I will give them myself as a legacy. I will give them my divinity and my humanity, my body and my soul, myself entirely and without reserve. I will make them this present at the last moment of my life, at a time when men are accustomed to bequeath to those whom they love that which they value the most. At the very moment when they are seeking to betray me, at the very moment when the Pharisees and Jews are planning to remove me out of the world, will, will give myself to men on earth to be their food and drink, to abide with them in the Blessed Sacrament in a wonderful manner, to be always in their midst by dwelling in their churches instead of withdrawing my love from them on account of their ingratitude. I will manifest it to them the more. Wonderful manner. Who could ever have imagined that God would go so far in his love for ungrateful men as to give them his own flesh and blood as the food of their souls? What man or angel would ever have conceived such a thing? And supposing it had occurred to some man or angel to wish that God might do so, who would have dared to express such a wish or to ask such a thing of God? Would not the thought that would not the thought have been immediately banished from the mind as sacrilegious? Now what the angels could have conceived nor men dare to ask, the immense love of God has given us, unasked. Hence our Lord was right indeed to say to his disciples, when they became sad on account of his having told them of his approaching departure from them, Let not your hearts be troubled. I will not leave you orphans. A good mother on her deathbed says to her weeping children, Dear children, I must now die and leave you. I recommend you to God and to the protection of your blessed mother Mary. Avoid sin and act always as good children, that I may be so happy as to see you again in the other world. But Jesus does not speak thus to his apostles. He says, You need not be sad, because I am about to leave the world. I will remain always with you in my most holy sacrament. I will give you a power than which there is no greater in heaven or on earth, that of changing bread into my body and wine into my blood. In virtue of this power, you can always have me with you. You need only pronounce the words of consecration over the bread and wine. And in that very moment, I will be with you, and you will hold me in your hands. O oh love, O oh love of God towards us, O oh Jesus, thou lovest us too much. Thou couldst not endure that we should be left alone in this world, world and that even death might not be able to separate thee from us. Thou didst leave thyself to us as our food in the Blessed Sacrament. Secondly, in order that we may see the love of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist still more clearly, let us consider with a lively faith whom we have in our midst. Dear Christian, consider if Jesus Christ had left a saint or an angel with us in his stead after his death, or if he had given us his own mother to remain with us and keep us company, would it not have been a very great proof of his love toward us? But he has left neither saint nor angel, not even his own mother, for it was too little for his love. 
he himself would be ever with us. Yes, indeed, the good God, the holy and merciful God, is among us. The Almighty God who created us and the whole world out of nothing, and who still continues to preserve us. That same God is in our tabernacles, who saved Noah from the deluge, who gave manna from heaven for the Jews, who amid lightning and thunder gave the Ten Commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai, who at Babylon delivered the three youths from the flames of the burning furnace, who saved the life of Daniel in the den of lions. That same Jesus is with us in our churches, who at this his birth was laid on straw and adored by the Magi, who fled into Egypt, who was sought for by the Blessed Virgin and found in the temple, who changed water into wine, who restored sight to the blind, made the deaf hear and the dumb to speak. Beloved Christian, you esteem Simeon happy in having been permitted to take the infant Jesus in his arms. And when you, were you to receive a grace like him, no doubt you would exclaim, Now dost thou dismiss thy servant, O Lord, according to thy word, in peace, because my eyes have seen thy salvation. You consider Zacchaeus happy because thy Lord vouchsafed to enter his house and to eat with him. You deem St. John happy because he rested on the breast of our Savior at the Last Supper. And above all, you regard the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Joseph so very happy because they nourished and supported our dear Lord. But are you not as happy as they? Are you not even happier? You do not hold our Lord in your arms, as Simeon did, but you receive him into your heart in Holy Communion. You do not rest on the bosom of our Lord like St. John, but the Savior himself rests in your heart after Holy Communion. You do not nurse and support our Lord like the Blessed Virgin and St. Joseph, but you have a still greater happiness, for the Savior himself nourishes you and gives himself to you as a, your food. O oh love, O oh love, O oh who could understand the love of God for men? 